Yes, I can see it. The red button comes out on the back. Too. Okay. So when I, I <coughs> but there's nothing showing up in the camera. You want to check? No. Mm -hmm. Well, it's on a white wall. And it's, it's just gray. Okay. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and this will be our okay I think we're okay yeah I can uh, see you can you yeah, okay yeah. terrific <laughs> so one of the things that I want to share with you is that collectively you have 94 years of experience 94 years it's hard to have that type of collective experience and not um, come up with the issues and strategies to resolve some of those issues. And I'm hoping that that is going to be um, one of our targets, utilizing that shared expertise uh, and the collective experiences of the group to um, really accentuate, highlight, augment our, um, our uh, focus on the field. And, to, and once again today, we're looking at theories and theorists, we're looking at developmentally appropriate practices, and we're looking at um, development. And hopefully, we're, we're um, actually, we're going to do um, a, uh, an overview of development, and we're also going to look at what will we know, what will we be doing with child development in the year um, 2030. So we're going to get some, uh, we're gonna leap forward to see uh, what will we be doing, what should we be doing. Um, in terms of a burning need or a focus that you have <coughs> for any of those topics that we'll be discussing today, or a question that came up during your readings or during your research, um, let's, put, let's put your ideas down so we can make sure that we address some of the needs that you feel that you have. Who wants to start? I can. Okay. In, our, in our role as leaders, having um, a set of new staff coming in fresh out of college where their baseline is not necessarily in child development, because that seems to be kind of bypassed with their new early childhood degree requirements, how do we as leaders get that information across in a productive manner that can be properly implemented into the classrooms? <coughs> on a consistent basis in a timely fashion to meet the needs of our children. Okay, so let's That's frame it. Let's frame the question. You're looking at how do we get the information about child development? How do we, you know, compress it, share it, um, ensure that people understand it? Okay. And interestingly enough, um, so you were saying Getting the message across. Getting How do we get the across. message across? Okay. And then, of course, to frame it, we'd have to take a look at what is the message. You know, and and when we look at that, we know that um, all. Um, all development is important and development uh, we focus on various realms of development it's not only many times we are in a classroom and what are we focusing on cognition we think okay cognitive development we need to um, we need to ensure that children are ready for school and what makes a child ready for school you know we can go through myth and reality. So what are some of the myths about what m makes a child ready for school? They need to write their name. I just didn't say with, the, numbers, with an uppercase letter. Numbers, letters, write their name with an uppercase and uh, or differentiate between upper uppercase and lowercase, lower okay? And um, be able to sit for 20 minutes at a time at the age of five. Okay, and, um, and these are myths of de uh, ab about what makes children ready for school. And what are the realities? Social, emotional. Social, emotional, definitely social, emotional, and that all children at age five are not all developmentally the same, so expectations <coughs> should vary from one child to another child. Lee, you were going to say something. Parents are very shocked 
now when you say to them and you look them in the eye and they're so worried about the letters and the numbers and the name and all those things and you say to them it needs to be coping skills and skills for them to get their point across because they're not ready to learn unless they can help themselves in the bathroom unless they can make sure that they're being fed unless their basic needs are being met and their jaw their jaws drop because they're worried so much about the letters that they're not even at that point yet anybody else want to add to that conversation very true so we have to get the message out but we have to get the right message correct mm -hmm. okay okay who else wants who else has an issue Something that you feel we need to address. Balance. I think adding, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go uh, ahead. I think adding on to Grace's point, um, people or these teachers are graduating from college with these four year degrees, and they, in actual reality, have zero. They, you put them in a classroom and they have no clue about early childhood. They mm -hmm. don't know about screening tools, they don't know about. Um, early childhood curriculums, they don't know about um, assessments. Lack of experience. Hands on experience. Okay, lack of hands on. So when you, um, when you say hands-on experience, I think what you're trying to do is differentiate between those individuals who've read about it in a book exactly. or not, because in a four-year curriculum, remember, uh, we're looking at potentially 30 credits or, um, you know, 10 courses in early childhood. And um, we include in that development, we should be ha looking at, um, we should be looking at, certainly we should be looking at assessment, um, but we're also looking at content in terms of what are the historical um, derivations of uh, early childhood. We're looking at the 12 special education credits that need to be part of every program. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at English language learners. We're looking at probably a behavior management course. We're taking a look at characteristics and needs of exceptional learners. We're taking a look at differentiated instruction. So we're taking a look at really a span of content. And um, <coughs> that's kind of crunched in with all of the other coursework that needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. And um, so what people do lack, although you know what Pennsylvania mandates, Pennsylvania mandates that there must be 150 hours of pre-student teaching taking place in settings. But the grade span for early childhood is still a broad grade, sp gr broad grade span. We're looking at pre-K to grade four. So the amount of time that you spend in any one setting, okay, um, delimits many times your opportunity to experience every setting in the depth that one might need. Mm -hmm. Good point. It also has to be brought forth too that it needs to be a quality experience. So some of the students are coming in and even, even when I'm teaching or even staff that are coming in or interns and your head would spin to think of the programs that they're going into that don't have the quality experience. So sometimes they're coming back to you and they're saying, well, this is the way that I did things in my internship, or this was what was expected, or this is the way that behavior management was conveyed to me, and this is what I know about it. And, you know, we were very blessed to be here at Keystone right from the beginning and, you know, and be behind the glass and watching and watching quality experiences. Or, you know, you go into the Grace's Center and you see quality experience or your center, but some of the students are not going into quality experiences, so it's looking at, you know, is it good experience? Well, one of the things that, once again, Pennsylvania Department of Education indicates that for individuals going out and doing field experiences, and certainly for student teaching experiences at the early childhood level, that programs should be at a star three or four mm -hmm. level. So there are guidelines in place yeah. to address these kinds of things. However, we know that quality is an elusive thing. Mm -hmm. And we could spend a whole day on quality being an elusive thing. So um, not all um, three <coughs> and four star programs are the same is what I think you're saying. 
and we will never be able to um, have the assuredness that every single program is the same because quality is elusive. But also, we have um, environmental factors, uh, we have economic factors, we have social factors, we have geographic factors that also come into play. And so a four-star program in a very high population, low resource and economic area, just because child care universally is a, um, a poor res poorly resourced um, initiative, okay, is not necessarily going to be the same as a four-star program uh, at a university level that's a demonstration project, mm -hmm. okay? And so we have this variation. And so I think what I hear you saying is um, the experiences are varied. Mm -hmm. Philosophically, no one tells us how necessarily to think about the ways in which we actually or, or, um, utilize or employ the programs that we use. So essentially, we also have the variation relative to a particular, a particular curriculum being implemented. And every one of you could have the same, you, can, you could in, implement the same curriculum and, and do it in very different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that comes from the experiences that you have had or not, okay, the ways in which you experienced what you had, meaning those individuals who mentored you, okay, and the beliefs that you hold beyond, okay, what you read about in terms of theories um, and in terms of programs. <coughs> so everyone, you know, comes to the arena holding different ideas, having different beliefs. And particularly, early childhood is tied so much into the ways in which we think, the ideas we hold about the ways children should be reared and educated. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I asked a question <coughs> about a six-month-old, who cries when he or she is put in a crib to go to sleep. Okay, so it's bedtime, eight o'clock, little Johnny's on a schedule. Put him down, okay, put him down, and you know, we can't put things in cribs, right? We can't put like, you know, you don't covers. have your pillow and your blanket and your no blanket, you know, no, <laughs> no blanket, none of those kinds of things. We all know that these are health and safety hazards, correct? So we put Johnny in and Johnny starts to cry. Okay. And um, if we talked about the length of time to allow that crying or whether or not it was developmentally appropriate, okay, we have all different kinds of ideas. And that's about one issue. So think about the multiplicity of issues that arise every day in the environment. Once again, what do we know about development and how does it inform our leadership? Meaning, what do we know about development and then what does it tell us to do? Okay. More issues. Yes, Liz. Um, I would say I need, I need to learn more skills to have my staff better balance and time manage their classrooms themselves. And I don't mean like the schedule with the kids, like, you know, we have our schedule posted. They're, you know, they're doing what they need to be do doing there. I'm thinking more on the end of, there's so much paperwork and there's so many different things that we need to do. We need to be thinking about training on the other end. And we need to be thinking about, you know, making sure our meal counts are done at time point of service. And we're looking at curriculum and we're looking at program planning and all of these different things that I don't want to have to be like hovering all the so time. So what, are, are you saying two things? I hear what you're saying about people have to manage their time, but. Um, balance. Balance their time, yep. absolutely. But you're also talking about external factors. The fact, every factor that you mentioned was a factor that arises 
because you are either in a STARS program and are uh, collecting, um, you know, CCIS subsidy, or you're going up the, um, maybe you're in a pre-K counts program. All mm -hmm. of these things are dictated to you externally. It's yeah. not something that you come to work every day and say, and now we're going to get to our paperwork. So I hear you saying, I hear you saying two things. I hear you saying um, that, you know, paperwork somehow interferes with development. It does. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And and interestingly enough, I hear you saying, how do you lead because it's like you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Exactly. How do you lead when you're unclogging the toilet, when you're taking the snake off the playground, when yes. you're yes. Well, well, okay. well, I haven't well, realized how chaotic our jobs were until I, my new center director has been with me for a month right. and a half now. And she, every day, she's like, wow, no two days are ever the same. No two and days like, are the right. same. Right. Okay. So how, and, and, and you, all of, while all of this is going on, while the toilet is clogging up and you're dealing with the worms in the sand, okay, and you're dealing with a staff member who is perpetually late <laughs> and a mom who is never quite happy. <laughs> development yeah. is happening. Right. You know, development is happening. And you know, there is a saying, children cannot wait. They cannot wait to get the nurturing right. that they need. They cannot wait to have the scaffolding so that they can go from waiting for a few minutes for gratification to actually moving into, well, you go first and I'll go next. You know, that term, uh, turn taking that, as we know, is critical. That social skill, and someone said social emotional, that's part of an executive function. Is it not turn taking? Yes. But development is happening. And what you're saying is the paperwork. It interferes with the with the message that we want to get out. Exactly. The paperwork, the chaos. Chaos, that's a good word. Mm -hmm. Somebody else said something else. The paperwork, the, um, the well, any kind of an interruption, but we're talking about families, we're talking about evaluators, we're talking about all those kinds of things that come into play. And I also think it's like priorities. Like yesterday I was working on my presentation because of course that took a backseat to the rest of like my life, which I'm sure you guys know that you're sitting there you're like, oh my gosh, I've learned this a thousand times, why can't it come out of my head? And I could hear a baby cry and I hear him cry and I hear him cry. And I walk in and my staff are doing exactly what they should be doing. They're putting all the kids to nap. He's sitting on their lap and he is just upset and he's newly transitioned over. He also just had open heart surgery. Oh, so no. he's like, you know, the kid's been through a lot. And, you know, they were struggling with the nurture versus the putting him down for a nap. And I think they need to understand the priorities too of what needs to be happening. And they said, well, you know, here's this bottle. Let's give him this bottle. And I dropped everything. Like, you know, I ran in there and just, and you know, like you get the snake off the playground, do what we do. It's, it's hard with a balance. So, you know, I put him down for a nap and I wrapped him and I gave him his bottle. And my staff just watched me and they're like, I'm like, he knows I dropped everything for him. He can feel that from me. He can't, like, he could feel the struggle from you of, I've got to get all these kids down from nap so that they're all napping so we can take breaks. But, you know, when you drop it and they know that you're there for them, right. like, we're here for you today, like, we feel like that yeah. and we have that feeling. He was like finally relaxed and the kid took a good nap for the first time in like days. And what I think you're looking for is for staff, and I didn't put pri oh I did, I did put priority, for staff to be able to prioritize that so that you don't have to do the heroic save, so you don't have to jump into the room. And sometimes we can learn a lot from other <coughs> cultures. When we look at development and we look cross-culturally at development, what might have been for that particular, because you know, once, a time, uh, once in a while we become very utilitarian. Um, we, um, um, we, we, have, we feel we have to do the most for the many. So mm -hmm. if our charge, if we're in a room with 12 toddlers and there's two staff members, okay, and w we feel we should be getting the 11 children down for nap. And that child who is not interested in a nap, okay, well that child's just gonna have to wait 
because we have to do the most for the many. I don't know where we got that, but that's what we think about. If you were to um, be transported to Buenos Aires or Uganda, okay, you'd love to be there on the beaches, okay, or Uganda, okay, or Thailand. Do you think there would be a different scenario? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think you might see in that particular classroom? They're not going to be putting them all down for nap at the same time, that's for sure. That's, that's one of them. And if they were, if that happened to be their protocol, because of course, you know, we know that development proceeds at varying rates, correct? Although it's fairly predictable and sequential, but it is occurring at varying rates. It's individual to the child. Okay, it's that child's individual timetable or individual clock. So it's a, it's a mystery to me. It's an enigma to me why we have everyone going down at the same time because sometimes what it does is it creates a very miserable atmosphere. Okay, but once again, we're saying the most for the many. many so if five or six children are used to taking a nap, let's get them all in. Okay. But that's also going by, you know, your rules and regulations because you're looking at trying to get everybody down for naps so you can Absol take breaks. Absolutely. You know, once again, right. once again, we are, we are, um, we are allowing, in many instances, all of the ruling, all of the regulations, okay, to obscure what our focus is on development. Am I saying we don't need rules or regulations? Please do not leave this room and say, Fran Langan said, we don't need these rules and regulations, you know. Down with star standards. No, I'm not saying that at all. I am not saying that. You know, obviously in an orderly universe, we need protocols, we need procedures, we need to have, however, when we talk about getting the message out, when we talk about getting the message out, okay, sometimes we have double speak. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. The problem is we are saying provide very consistent care, yes. low key, you know, get on the floor with the children. Um, tune in to their specific needs. Um, provide the additional time necessary. Do we not say that? You know, here's the child um, considering the very, the temperamental, the temperamental uh, proclivities that children have. We, we talk about the slow to warm, okay? Uh, the child that needs that extra, that extra time. Okay, and then on the other hand we say, you know that report needed to be done. Where's the incident report? I'm mm -hmm. meeting with the family. I don't have the incident report. And the, and the staff member saying, I just, I didn't have enough time. What do you mean you didn't have enough time? This is an important bit of information, okay? So, um, Sometimes we have to think about, we might have the right message, and we might get the message out, but what there is a divide between what we say and then what our expectations are and then how we expect our program to run. It is not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. However, acknowledging why we have that difficulty is and understanding <coughs> the kinds of things we might do to address the difficulty may help us may help us. There are no, let me tell you something, there's no recipes, but there are organized thought, thought processes that can lead us to a better solution than perhaps we've been utilizing. Okay. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. find one today. Uh, wouldn't it be good, we'll publish the book yeah. and we'll get on the talk shows. This is what I like. Okay. <laughs> um, I just really want to meet Ellen. <laughs> do you, who do you, Ellen? Yeah. Okay, well let's uh, I would say that there are people on Ellen that have far less experience than you all do. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we could do a group trip. Okay, what else? And then we're going to move on to our um, theories and theorists and then take a look at this as well. What other, what other kinds of things? Yes. Tanya. I know for myself and, and my experience, but as you touched on Keystone Stars, I'm looking at how to remedy, as I'm learning about developmentally appropriate practice, the star standards, as you ladies were talking about, and how they truly do fit into providing.
provide me with those experiences of being able to fully administer your classroom practices as well as support those developmentally appropriate practices. So as I'm learning more about these things, I'm trying to figure out how the systems all come together and how those can really support each other and does it necessarily support all of it. Okay, so yeah. what you're looking at, does it, do the systems and the integration of the systems actually support development? Good question. Very good question. That's what I worked okay. on yesterday. <laughs> At least it's getting better. Well, and it's going to be better in a couple of years, according to my conversation yesterday. Because we had the same questions that you just said, Fran, yesterday, which was very interesting. Well, I, I think that um, lots of stakeholders are looking at this. Mm -hmm. A lot of stakeholders are looking. Um, are the systems that we have in place, are they proactive? Are they, um, are they in alignment w with what the realities are? Right. Okay, and, and one of the best examples that I can give are the hands-off food. You know, you, know, those, <laughs> you know, for a while, we couldn't even change the conversation. Uh, because when I would talk with uh, small groups of people or larger groups of practitioners and talk about, oh, my best is, um, let's take a look at the routines that we do with children. And are these routines that we come up with, are they based on what we know about child development? So we talk about circle time and we talk about um, we, t we talk about lunch time, we talk about nap time, the big routines, we have to have them. Mm -hmm. And so lots of times we talk about children are in um, their calendar time in the morning, whatever we call it, okay? <laughs> I think most people don't call it circle time anymore. What do we call it? Circle. Oh, circle. Morning okay. meeting. Morning, morning meeting. meeting. Oh yes, we have the, the, the very carpet time. Yes, so that we're we're trying to give out the uh, impression that we're like carpet time. Oh, soft, kind of fuzzy, furry. Let's just get together. Yet, yet, we we say that, and then we say um, crisscross applesauce which means like <laughs> you might as well put them in a bodysuit because we're not moving from this circle. And children will say, you might say, what's the weather like today? And somebody might say, oh, I was outside last night and there were stars. Yeah. Johnny, we're talking weather today. Rain, shine, sun, no stars, honey, <laughs> it's daylight. Okay, so we are very scripted or at and is that, is that the kind of program? Now I'm obviously embellishing a little bit, but then the truth given is. the variation in programming, perhaps not. Perhaps the embellishment is more, is closer to reality than we'd like to think. Yeah. Um, this, so then we come to snacks. Now I would say, think about all of the rigmarole you go through trying to get snack out for children. If you have a classroom and you might have 19 um, in, uh, children in the classroom, and the, so you have to get the table all set up and then you have to serve all the children, all this. What about the idea of self-serve snack? Oh, we try to do that. That is, CACFP doesn't like it, Keith and Stars doesn't exactly, like it. Exactly. The, so, a like protocol, it a absolutely, we set it up as a center, that. set yeah, it up as yeah. a center, and there has to be protocols. I mean, certainly you don't want the children digging into the peanut butter crackers, okay, and touching them all. Oh, Fran, um, there's no peanut butter no anymore. I know, I know, because of the allergies. <laughs> I understand that, but you know, <laughs> some of our love, tried and true <sighs> things that, that children love. Of course there are none. And of course there, are, there would never be a coffee cake, even though children might love that because it wouldn't be healthy. And, so, <laughs> and, and, and we don't do grapes food. because they might choke and it takes us too much time to cut them. <laughs> I have it. I understand it. So we, um, and then the other thing is, what kinds of experiences, and this is a good question about development, what kind of experiences do we deprive children of mm -hmm. because we're concerned about the rules and, and regulations. But, and w to, just to finish off the idea about the self-serve snack, people would say, are you kidding? They can't even touch the food. They have to keep their hands up in the air. 
because of, of some of our protocols. So those are the kinds of things. Should do development, should what we know about development lead us? Or should what we know about standards be much more, or should standards be much more in tune with what we know about development? <coughs> and so we need to create, we need to create systems, okay? that understand each other and that when integrated, that can't, first of all, that can be integrated because sometimes the systems that we create cannot be integrated with what we know about development. Have you seen the ECHR 7 yet? I have, I, I, I have it uh, in one of the drawers of my desk. Is it more, it, no, my ECMH rep told me the other day when she came out that it's much more sensitive to the interactions. Is it much more sensitive to the development, like you're saying, I have, I have I, not, I have not been it. able to look at it in that light at this point. It is sensitive. You know, we are it's getting more, much, yeah, more, it's much more. It's we are, we are getting. Uh, for those of you who looked at it in that uh, perspective, can you share? Um, like they're not going to come out and count the number of books that you have in your classroom. It's, it's, it's much more the experiences. It's much more on the teacher and the conversations that they're having in the classroom with children and, and what they're, they're talking about, how they're expanding on questions, how they're expanding on. It's really okay. more in correlation to class. They're trying to okay. incorporate class into Eckers to make it more um, integrated into our systems because they listen to the practitioners. Basically what I was told, they listen to the practitioners and this is what they're saying is the interactions are more important than the actual environmental ratings, which is really not necessarily true, but so they try to make it a collaborative effort, which is the reason that they're switching. Right. You know, sometimes you need both and. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just need it. As hard of a pill as that is to swallow, we need both. I, I, I feel very strongly about that. We need quality environments. Oh, if you're looking yes, at you environments, Absolutely. and we need stuff in those environments, whatever you want to call them, whether they're uh, books or yeah. whether they're materials or whether, do they have to be bought from a catalog? Absolutely no. not. I have gone to very um, um, programs that I would say are operating at a really high level and they are not you know, purchasing things from childcraft and that doesn't mean that I don't like childcraft. I, 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 you know, I have to be very aware of what I'm saying because I'm being taken. I like childcraft. It's just that we can have very high quality programs that use um, materials from the environment. But do we need them? Yes, because children learn at very rapid rates. And we know all of the brain research, okay, about pruning. Um, and, uh, and we know about myelinization, and we know these kinds of things, okay? And so we have to be very, very cognizant of what we're providing children with. Yeah. We have them for very long periods of time during the day. And so, and, and that kind of information needs to inform what kind of programming we're providing. But does that mean just because we have state-of-the-art equipment and supplies that we can forget about the power of human interaction, the power of it, the ability for us to be able to illustrate to a child through our actions, through our voices, through whether or not we smile, okay? Smiling behavior. Um, and also openness of, con uh, openness of opportunity for children so that we are not pigeonholing children so that children are allowed to experiment and explore, assess what they may want to do and not do, and they're not, um, and they're not made to do certain things. So yes, I totally agree that uh, we have to really monitor our interactions. We have to assess our interactions. How open, how pro-social are we? <coughs> you know, it's very interesting that we expect from a developmental perspective that children um, must develop pro-social interactions. And we focus a lot on those pro-social interactions. How pro-social are we? How pro-social? I'm getting smiles from some of you. Okay. 
you know, and, and, and we do. But I think your first question was getting the message out. Getting the message out. Getting yeah. the message out and having them buy into it. Right? Yes. That's does everyone have an opportunity to share? Anybody else? I think with leadership, um, it goes hand in hand with professionalism. And I think sometimes the students that are coming right out of college, like we said, um, they're being trained or, or taught um, and looking forward to being a teacher, but they don't necessarily come with that professionalism, you know, whether it be their dress, their interaction with the parents. Um, I think a lot now the technology, um, the cell phones, you know, you have teachers that are taking it a little bit farther and texting parents or sending pictures or, you know, with social media, posting things on social media that um, shouldn't be posted, you know. I think yeah. that's something that lacks, that the teachers lack, especially in the room. And I think that that is something that we will definitely get into as we um, move forward. From a developmental perspective, uh, we're looking at child development, but you're looking at development of the professionals um, and or paraprofessionals that are coming to work in our programs. And in addition to knowing about what is appropriate for children, and the appropriate ways in which um, they must uh, act um, to ensure that children receive optimal um, opportunities for developing, um, we also have to focus on where our staff happen to be developmentally. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that's a good point. Okay, I think it's a good point. Um, I think that the expectations that we had 20 years ago for 22-year-olds were much more um, um, appropriate yes. than the expectations that we have in 2015 for 22-year-olds. You know, it's very difficult sometimes to get the whole package. And so we have to, um, we have to understand what are our expectations for this package um, with the new graduate. And um, we might have to look at what the realities are. Because that's going to lead us. That's going to lead us. It's going to help us with the message. It tells us that we have to, just like with young children, we have to respond to our staff from a developmental perspective. Where are they in the social emotional realm? Where are they in the physical realm? Because, you know, lots of times you, you ask staff to do things. And I think in most uh, handbooks for staff, you must be able to lift 50 pounds and those kinds of things. And, and then you have, um, you know, young people coming in. You say, lift? You know, I never even grocery shopped. I don't lift, lift grocery bag. Okay, so where are they socially and emotionally? Where are they physically? Where are they cognitively relative to their information? about development. So from a leader perspective, these are all the considerations that you have to make. So that's a good point. We haven't been talking about our staff and where they are developmentally because that's going to be so important. And sometimes you have to think about those things before a hire is made. And many times we're looking for warm bodies. Right. And I think you have to also take your differential between once you hire them, you have to decide once you figure out their developmental level, if you haven't done it during the interview process, is will this person and all of the work needs to put in, is it going to benefit and how long will it actually take before we get, the which is, level. right, the end product, and which what, is also a difficult place for it's a, a It's a very difficult uh, place because if you take um, a new person, doesn't make any difference if that new person has, um, is right out of um, higher education institution or if that individual has been maybe home with children and now re-entering the workforce or if the individual has worked in a variety of different places. Mm -hmm. If you have a set of interview <coughs> questions that looks at that individual from a developmental perspective, it is going to give you so much insight because you do have to make that determination. How long will it take to um, have this staff member be a contributing, participatory member of the team? 
And if you allow your information, your knowledge about child development, and you, um, and you combine that knowledge of child development with what you know a leader needs to have at his or her disposal, you, you have to remember children can't wait. They can't wait a year for no. someone to get up to speed. They can't wait a year for someone to understand scaffolding um, um, behaviors that they might need to utilize. I agree that that's a good screening tool, but I think we can all agree as well that there, there's just a special craft to what we do. There's a reason why we're all sitting here on a Saturday taking time out of our lives for the next year, year and a half of our lives to do this. And there's certain things with staff too that you could have all of this education or all of this experience, you could have a million years of experience and just not have it. And then you could have somebody walk in who you're like, oh my gosh, like, and you feel good. And you're mm -hmm. like, we don't have to worry about this classroom. But then on the same token, a person that makes you feel good doesn't necessarily produce that product in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Every, some people interview better and answer questions better, but their actual classroom management or style mm -hmm. isn't necessarily exactly. what you had expected during the interview. Exactly. And, and it's a tough place. from a leader perspective, there are things that you can put in place so that you then don't make a hire that um, you are saddled with in perpetuity, <laughs> okay? Okay, and so we will talk uh, more about that, which has to do more with developmental, uh, you know, the developmental needs of, of, of your staff um, than, than right now we're looking at children. But that's something to keep in mind so we can, can come back to it. Thanks for okay. that. Terrific. So let's get started um, with our theories and theorists who's going to go first, and I'm going to turn the camera off for a minute so we can focus it on you. Okay. You're going first? I'll be brave. All right, thanks. You'll be brave, John. 